so yeah this is um this is the first lecture of the series but we are um glad to see so many people um there's been a really nice high level of interest in this course and given the breadth of material that's going to be covered uh, across the four main modules um i hope that everyone uh, attending can gain some new insights uh, understanding um and probably raise a few questions uh from the lectures so um on the topic of questions, I'd like to remind everyone that there is a chat um, function here. We would like to use that to um, receive all of the questions from you. So please try to use only use the, the chat box for questions that you would like to be answered by uh, the lecturer um, or perhaps also some of the panelists. Um, uh, and so if you as those questions come to you through the lecture, just throw them into the chat box uh, and then once the lecture is over, uh, we'll go through and uh, try to answer as much of the material uh, there as possible. Um, okay, so because this is the first lecture of the series uh, or the course, um, we do have a couple of, um, uh, we have a short uh, introduction um, from Dr. Sathyendranath uh, first. So uh, I'd just like to introduce um, her and, and pass the floor to her. So um, Dr. Shubha Sathyendranath is uh, a world expert on ocean color and remote sensing uh, in, and, and marine optics. Um, she was ed educated in India and France uh, and has over 40 years of experience uh, in research fields uh, that this lecture series covers, um, such as bioptical properties of phytoplankton, um, biophysical feedbacks in the ocean, primary production, phenology, uh, algorithm development, and um, a huge breadth of topics around ocean color uh, and climate. So uh, Dr. Sathyundana's expertise has um, resulted in her receiving numerous awards, such as the Grand Madei Albert Premier from Monaco, and most recently the Huntsman Medal. Um, she has devoted considerable effort to capacity building uh, in developing countries, uh, for which she has received the IOC UNESCO uh, NK Panikar Medal. Um, and the Trevor Platt Science Foundation was founded um, by Dr. Sathyundana. So. I would like to take the opportunity to pass the floor to her and let her introduce this course as a whole uh, before we move on to the main lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for that very kind introduction. Um, dear participants from all over the world, welcome to the online component of the training course on satellite based tools for investigating aquatic ecosystems. The course is being organized by the Trevor Platt Science Foundation jointly with a number of co-sponsors, the Partnership for Observation of the Global Oceans, the NF Pogo Alumni Network for Oceans, the European Space Agency, particularly their projects BICEP and Vigian, the Nansen Scientific Society, the International Ocean Color Coordinating Group, the Scientific Committee on Oceanic Research, the UKRI Grand Challenges Networking Project onward, UMEDSAT with the European Copernicus Program, the NERC Earth Observation Data Acquisition and Analysis service of the UK and by the Plymouth Marine Lab. The online component of this training course is hosted by the European Space Agency. You will see that at each lecture, ESA will serve as your host, and in many of the lectures, you will find Stefano Ferretti or Maria Lenrio from ESA being present. Um, I would like to thank all the sponsors for their many contributions, without which this event would, have, would not have happened, and certainly not at this scale. Now, the course is organized into four modules. There's an introductory one with four lectures, followed by one on water quality and human health, also four lectures. The next one, after that is on ocean ecosystems and climate. And the last section of the last module will take you through a number of tools available for accessing 
and processing satellite data and other types of big data. There is a structure to the course. They're not just uh, disconnected lectures. And you will get the most out of it if you attend all the lectures. So please try not to miss any of them. For those of you who are going on to attend the subsequent in-person training course, the online modules are designed to prepare you for the in-person component. Before I close, let me say a few words about the man behind the Trevor Platt Science Foundation and the people behind the course. Trevor Platt was a brilliant oceanographer and aquatic ecologist with a broad interest in many environmental problems. His passion for scientific research blended seamlessly with his other passion, teaching and training, especially in developing countries. Over the, over the years, he organized many training courses and initiated many capacity building activities that benefited hundreds of scientists and students worldwide. We are now following in his footsteps in organizing this series of events. The organizers are members of the foundation who have all volunteered their time to this initiative. The lecturers who will be addressing you today and over the weeks and months to come are mostly former trainees or students of Trevor who have now stepped up to train the next generation of scientists working on various aspects of marine and freshwater ecosystems and remote sensing tools to investigate them. And let me thank all the organizers and speakers for the commitment and enthusiasm they have put into the preparation and execution of this training course. We appreciate that you are all coming from different parts of the world and that you have varying backgrounds and levels of preparation. And we will do our level best to start with the basics and lead you to the latest discoveries and tools. As Tom has already mentioned, there will be an opportunity at the end of each lecture to pose your questions through the chat. So please leave the chat free just for the questions and uh, that you want to ask. And then each of the lecturers will try to address them all. Now, if Trevor were here, he would have said all that is required of you, the participants, is to do your best and then the rest will follow. So please make the most of this opportunity. We all thank you for your interest in this course and hope that the time spent with us will be very fruitful for you, all of you. And thank you very much. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much uh, for that, Shiva. Um, very nice words and yeah, very good sentiment. Um, so uh, with that, um, I think we will move on to the main lecture. Uh, again, it's been, it's fantastic to see so many uh, people and the, uh, the welcomes and hellos from all around the world. Um, but if we could try to keep the chat, uh, once the lecture starts, uh, mostly for the questions, that will aid us in getting all the questions answered. So on to the, the main uh, lecture, and that's going to be given by Dr. Lauren Beerman. Uh, Lauren has degrees in ichthyology, molecular biology, and marine biology, but discovered marine remote sensing during her PhD at the University of St. Andrews and has, I think, been in love with it ever since. So after working for the UK government within CFAS as a senior Earth observation scientist for a number of years, she joined uh, Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Um, and she's been undertaking research at PML for about five years uh, with a main interest focused around the detection of floating material uh, including plastics, um, ships and vessels, and vegetation. Um, Dr. Beerman has been involved in multiple uh, remote sensing training courses on topics around remote sensing and the use of sentinel data, 
So I consider us very fortunate to have her give us the introduction to remote sensing in the oceans. So please, Lauren, over to you. Everything was perfect until it wasn't. After an introduction like that, I don't think I'm allowed to make mistakes. <laughs> Thank you, TJ. Uh, yes, I'm Dr. Lauren Behrman, and it's my job today, in fact, it's my honor today to be able to talk to you in a very broad sense about remote sensing of the oceans. Um, and so you're going to, as, as Shuba has very um, aptly told you, um, there are going to be a number of modules that take you through um, everything I'm going to talk about today in much more detail, but this is just hopefully going to give you a nice introduction um, to remote sensing of the oceans. And I think one of the first things one should do in a talk like this is justify why. Why do we care about remote sensing when we talk about marine ecosystem monitoring? Um, and that's because really genuinely, this is one of the best tools that we have for observing our Earth. We have data from long time series studies um, in around Hawaii and Bermuda. These are hot and bad. And even in the gyres that we consider to be relatively uh, the equivalent of ocean deserts, um, we have seen annual cycles and interannual inter variability of phytoplankton, of microscopic floating plants in these remote ocean gyres. So we see that there is a diversity and, and patterns within even the least productive waters on Earth. However, unfortunately, even if we had uh, bats and hot all over the world, we would still be collecting point measurements across our oceans. And it is only with remote sensing that we can elevate that data to be able to get overviews and synoptic coverage um, for entire oceans. And when it comes to ecosystem monitoring, we have so many amazing tools at our disposal. And I would say some of the key things that we can monitor from space and that we use for ecosystem monitoring are things like sea surface height, ocean color, and sea surface temperature. And we are able to observe these, these variables from low Earth orbit using a number of sensors. And you can spend an entire career, devote your entire academic and research life to any one of these three topics. But I would say the most interesting thing happens when you combine them. For example, if you look at ocean color along with sea surface temperature, you can understand and observe things like harmful algal blooms, the dynamics of plumes along coastal edges, coral bleaching, and of course, human health. And human health is such an important theme in this series. It takes up a, a module that is going to be covered by Grinson, Schuber, Gemma, and Milton. So, um, this is the intersect where we're able to use different data sets to tell us really important things. Between ocean color and sea surface height, we start to understand things like sea ice dynamics. We're able to track and observe underwater volcanic eruptions and internal waves. And of course, something very important uh, is an application for transport of things that are good, so phytoplankton blooms, and things that we should be worried about, like pollutants at the intersect of sea surface height and sea surface temperature, uh, we're able to look at eddies, um, anomalies. We're able to start to contribute to forecasting and maritime safety and um, observe storm dynamics as well. And of course, I've talked about the intersect between two at a time, but the magic really happens when we look at the center and we look at the overlap of all three. Because when we do that, we're able to see things like essential climate variables. We're able to become really involved in disaster response. Um, El Nino and La Nina, the states and the impact. So these are things we can observe and track using the intersect of these three. Climate model assimilation, uh, insurance risks, which underpin the aspects really of our, of our lived experiences, marine spatial planning and anomaly development, which is very important. And so having now told you that uh, we're able to look at ecosystem, ecosystem monitoring using these three types of variables, you are perhaps not going to be surprised to know that there are lots of different sensors out there that are going to be able to help you to do that. 
And I think one of the most interesting things is that switch that happens when you start to become a, when you start to integrate remote sensing into your research, um, which is you first arrive and you don't know what's out there. And after a period of time, you know what's out there and you start to go, but there's so much out there. What do I actually use? Um, but ultimately, as different or as unique as each of the senses are, they are underpinned by by a very similar by similar physics. And that is that all of them utilize sections of the electromagnetic spectrum and each region of the electromagnetic spectrum will tell us different things. So different satellites utilize different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And from that, we can derive different variables to measure. Um, passive and active sensors are used for ocean monitoring. So we're gonna cover this in a bit more detail. Passive sensors are your optical sensors. They rely on sunlight coming through the Earth's atmosphere, striking the Earth's surface, interacting in some way with the target that you're interested in, bouncing back through the atmosphere and striking the targets on your Earth observation, on your instruments on a satellite. It's quite extraordinary. Um, active sensors are different in that they don't rely on sunlight. They can see through cloud. They send out a signal in the electromagnetic range and then they receive the backscatter from a surface interaction. But both of these can be used for ocean monitoring. Uh, within optics, different bands that are collected um, can be used for different processes. So for example, for ocean color, uh, you might be most interested in two or three bands, but actually it's information collected all of the way into the shortwave infrared that's going to be necessary for you to do an atmospheric correction. So all of these data are important. And if I've misled you, I apologize. I've made it sound like this is a perfect solution to doing the job of ecosystem monitoring of the oceans. But it is important for me to start and end with this message. There have to be trade-offs because there is no one perfect tool for one perfect job. And the trade-offs tend to be around temporal and spatial scales. And the British have a lovely term. I really like this, the rule of thumb, or in general, you can't have everything. And I think that's true for just about all types of science, uh, but remote sensing is, uh, is the same. And I've divided this up into time requirements, but you can split this the other way around. If you need data collected multiple times in a day or at very specific times, the sensors that are going to be available to you for the job are going to be sensors aboard drones or airplanes. They collect very high spatial resolution over small areas and they do so on the day that you specify. You can fly that drone yourself and collect the data yourself on the day that you need to do it. Or commercial satellites, which collect very high spatial resolution data over specific areas and you have some control over at what period of time that data are collected. If, however, you need data every single day, you're on a totally different system here because you're going to be uh, using data at low spatial resolution from satellite sensors that have revisit times of one to two days. So very different things with just a day's difference. If you need data every two to five days, so we're looking at maybe once a week to every couple of weeks, I think this is the sweet spot personally for me for my work. You get to collect, you get to access high spatial resolution data with moderate spatial coverage, um, but um, you get the data every few days. And of course, if you only want to get an overview of what's happening on monthly, seasonal or annual scales, um, then you, you have a better selection, but you tend to be looking at data at level three or level four. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. So I've tried to sort of uh, visualize what I've just talked about and illustrate it in this way. And hopefully it uh, takes away the confusion and doesn't add to it. But if you are, as I said, looking for data collected multiple times a day or on a specific day, you're looking somewhere over here and I hope you can see my mouse. Um, you're looking at your drones and commercial satellites which collect data at very high spatial resolution um, on your specific days, but actually geostationary satellites might also be able to give you data um, every day or multiple times a day, but the spatial scale is different. The, Ocean color satellites that I'm going to talk about today um, give you data on daily scales at resolutions of about 300 meters to one to four kilometers. Then if you need data multiple times a week or multiple times a month, you get these satellites at higher spatial resolutions and temporal resolutions of about a week. And then at the process scale, if you want data once a month, once a season or annually, you start to look at these level three, level four composites. 
This will make sense to you by the end of the talk. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about these satellites within this realm. And I'm going to focus specifically on ocean color. Why ocean color? More specifically, what is ocean color? It is literally what it says. Uh, it is the color of water. When sunlight hits the ocean, some is reflected back, but, but most of it penetrates the surface and interacts with water molecules and whatever else is in the water. Now, if you've ever been lucky enough to go scuba diving, uh, one trick that's really cool is you take down something red and within a very short distance below the surface of the water, it turns brown. Red wavelengths of light are absorbed really efficiently by water. And as we move out of the visible into near infrared wavelengths of light, that becomes even more true. Uh, near infrared light hardly ever penetrates below the skin of the water. However, blue light and even green light can penetrate much further at these shorter energetic wavelengths and so we're able to derive a lot of information between the green, the blue, and the red. The reason we care so much about this is um, because phytoplankton are the base of the marine food web, and that is a simplification, but ultimately, if you think of phytoplankton as the grass of the ocean, you'd know that absolutely all life in, in the sea is somehow linked to these tiny microscopic unicellular organisms that we can't even see with our eyes. But they are responsible for, photos. They, through the process of photosynthesis, they take up carbon dioxide. They're responsible for removing more atmospheric CO2 um, and they convert that into organic matter, which then gets eaten and sinks. So this is very simplistic, but don't worry about it. You're going to hear a lot more about this from Anna, um, who's going to talk about the role of phytoplankton and ocean color. Um, and I wanted to share this with you. Um, this is a really beautiful animation that was put together by NASA, um, showing you the color of the ocean and of the land. And I like that these are linked because you really should think about phytoplankton as something that is not so separate from what is happening on land, from plants. We have in the ocean, we have deserts, we have jungles, we have parts of the ocean that are rapidly changing. Um, and these changes reflect multiple physical and physiological changes in the ocean itself. Uh, in many regions, we're seeing decreases in productivity uh, due to changes in nutrient supplies, which are driven by temperature changes. So what we see there is a response driven by changes um, in more physical drivers. In polar regions, the reduction in sea ice is changing productivity as more sunlight reaches the ocean surface. Um, in the mid to high latitudes, there's complex complex interactions between stratification and light limitation and nutrient limitation um, and, increase, and increased growth rates because of the warmer temperatures. We're seeing changes in structures and communities all over the world. There is, there, is, there is changes happening in every single part of the world. And we can see this through the base of the marine food web because of these microscopic drifting plants that when they are, when they are in their niche and they receive enough sunlight and nutrients, they bloom in such capacities that we can see the way that they change the color of blue water to, to closer to the green and the red. And we can see that to such an extent that we can measure it from space. And Anna, of course, is going to be talking about this more. And so is Thomas Jackson, Heather Bowman, um, Margaret and Dio. Uh, this is part of um, follow on modules because it's such an important recurring theme. But this is really, you know, you don't actually have to see the ocean to understand ocean color. If you've ever seen a lake or a river, um, I'm sure you'll understand what I'm talking about when I talk about muddy waters or waters that have been changed in some way by something inside of it. So river estuaries, for example, here's a nice example. They're brown because of resuspended sediment. Here's an example of a bloom in the North Sea and that blue water has been moved closer to the green. In the Atlantic Ocean on the top right hand side, that is water that has no phytoplankton in it, whereas in the Florida red tide, that is water that has perhaps too much phytoplankton in it. And all of this is the, the color of the ocean is now changed by what is in it. And uh, of course, because nothing is simple, uh, we have to understand the fact that we like to measure water closer to land, and that's where things get really complicated. So complex waters, because of the influence of land, because of runoff and sea dom and resuspended sediment, it then becomes increasingly tricky to distinguish what is changing the color of the water and in what proportions. Is it phytoplankton or is it sediment? Um, and Son is going to talk more about this uh, during the course as well. But ultimately, 
we're looking for these microscopic unicellular drifting plants as the sentinel species. They're telling us everything that we need to know about the ocean. And they themselves just alone are beautiful. I'm going to start off with the remote sensing data that you can look at yourself um, in terms of ocean color as well from NASA, because I think at the end of the day, when we think about ocean color, the first organization we think about is NASA. Um, so we're going to start with them because they deserve this place at the beginning, certainly. Um, and we're going to talk about perhaps their flagship sensor, um, certainly at the moment, which is MODIS. These uh, radiometers sit aboard two sensors, the Terra and Aqua satellites, and they give us extraordinary coverage every two days with data acquired in 36 bands at 300 meter spatial resolution, which means MODIS has been giving us data for over 20 years, which is incredible. I know for a fact there are people on this course that are younger than these satellites, but we can go back and see what was happening in the summer of 2002, thanks to MODIS, and then in the spring of 2003, and then we can compare how things look now to how they looked 20 years ago. But actually, 20 years is maybe nothing, because we can go back further than that, thanks to SeaWIFs and the Coastal Zone Color Scanner, these have been these sensors collected data um, in, from 1997 and 1986, um, at, and SeaWiFs collected data at 1.1 kilometer resolution, spatial resolution in eight bands on daily scales. So we can go back to 1998 to see what the oceans looked like compared to now. But actually, we can go back further than that, and that's thanks to USGS and NASA, uh, a joint program called Landsat. And these were launched in 1970. So the, the Landsat data that we can use was launched in 1979. And I'm very old, but that's older than me. So there has been data collected by Landsat since before I was born, every 16 days, initially in four spectral bands, but now at 311 with the new generation of Landsat at 30 meter spatial resolution. And I hope that you stopped there and thought 30 meter spatial resolution, because before this, I was talking about 300 meters, 1.1 kilometers. How has this been such a step change? Well, that's because Landsat is primarily a terrestrial mission. But this is going to be a recurring theme in this talk as well. Just because something was built for land doesn't mean it can't tell you something about water. And this is one of my favorite examples of an underwater volcanic eruption as observed by Landsat, showing you new land developing and changing fundamentally the color of the water around it. And I really love this example. 30 meter spatial resolution data every 16 days, we managed to get such great gaps in the cloud. And this has persisted to this day with new land, which has changed the color of the water around it um, due to, because of the amount of sediment that was resuspended, but also the nutrients and the change to stratification in the area. And that leads me to the next generation of satellites through the Copernicus program. Now, what I didn't mention before, or if I did, um, I, I'm, I would like to reiterate it. All of the data I'm going to talk about in this talk and all of the data I've mentioned so far are freely available to any of you. You can use it for anything you want. Um, and this is true for the Copernicus program as well. Uh, the data are available to you for free. Um, and Ben Loveday is going to talk a little bit more about how you can access these data as well. Um, within Copernicus, though, we have two agencies, and this is important about data access. Uh, UMETSAT takes care of uh, generally the marine component, whereas ESA, the European Space Agency, takes care of the terrestrial component. Um, and you might, you might be wondering why there is a, a split of responsibility there, and that is because of how ambitious the Copernicus program is. It is responsible for so many things um, that it would be um, that it, it does make sense to have organizations take responsibility responsibility for different aspects. And I'm only going to be talking about this tiny component of what is going on within the European Commission's Copernicus program. Um, and I apologize in advance. This is a horrible slide, but it is a really important one. So please uh, bear with me. Uh, the point of this slide is to show you the sort of umbrella of the European Commission's Copernicus program. And it's important because at some stage you are going to want to access the data. And I would just like you to remember the slide when you inevitably go to ESA for marine data or you mess up for terrestrial data and you go, oh, wait, I remember that horrible slide. I go to you mess up for marine data 
either to ESA for terrestrial data or marine data collected by Sentinel-1 or 2. Because even though ESA collects terrestrial data from terrestrial satellites, like I showed you with Landsat, there are marine data everywhere. You just need to know how to find it. But we're going to start with Sentinel-3. This is our beautiful blue ocean satellite. It's a dedicated marine mission, and it carries three sensors, which already make, makes it extraordinary. I'm predominantly going to talk about ULTI because we're interested in ocean color. And ocean color data here are collected at 300 meter spatial resolution from 21 bands on a one to two uh, revisit time, so almost a daily basis. Sentinel-3A has been collecting data for us since 2016. So we have data going back to 2016 and that data doubled up in 2018. So um, the Sentinels always act as a constellation of two and they, they do that in order to cover themselves in case something goes wrong with one of the satellites, but also because of cloud gaps. Uh, ULCHI is a passive sensor. It cannot see through cloud. It can't measure data at night. And cloud gaps are a big problem with optical sensors, but having two going in conjunction helps you to fill in those gaps. And it also means you have better coverage. Now, the mission's primary objectives, of course, there are different uh, data delivered uh, to, for terrestrial applications, but the primary objective of, this blue sentinel, of the Blue Sentinel is to deliver a sea surface height, sea surface temperature, and chlorophyll. And this is what it looks like. These are where the three sensors are situated. We have the SLSTR, which is the sea and land surface temperature radiometer uh, to collect our sea surface temperature and land surface data. But we're obviously gonna focus on the sea surface temperature. We have ULCHI, which is our chlorophyll or ocean color sensor and the ocean and land color instrument. And then SRAL, which is our long track um, surface radiometer, um, SAR ultimate, sorry. And UMETSAT is responsible for operating these satellites and for the data access, per, data processing and um, dissemination. So this is where you access uh, your ULCHI, your SLSCR and your SRAL data. And the applications are really only as small as your imagination, but I've put up the ones that are relevant to the modules uh, that you're going to be following on from this talk, which is, for example, human health, like tracking waterborne diseases. By measuring, by taking the temperature of the skin of the sea, we're able to start to assess um, and look for sea surface temperature anomalies in conjunction with chlorophyll A and pH to assess risk of cholera outbreaks along coastlines. And this is really important because as sea surface temperature increases, so too does the risk of these Vibrio infections under warming conditions. And you can measure this data at the same time as your ocean color data to give you chlorophyll A, which is really important. Um, the along track radiometer uh, data, altimeter data, sorry, that is collected um, is an active sensor. So this can see through cloud, which means it can see through storms, and it allows you to get measurements of sea surface height anomalies and wave height. So you can start to be prepared for disasters and you can start to be involved in maritime safety by using this along track um, altimeter data. I just wanna say thanks to Ben and Haley who have been, who provided a lot of these slides, um, but this is the active sensor stroll aboard Sentinel-3. And then of course our focus for ocean color is ULCHI. And this is just such a beautiful example of what ULCHI can do. It's really showing off in this and you might not realize why, but I just wanna say, if you look at the color bar, ULCHI in a single scene is able to resolve the difference between water that contains practically no phytoplankton at 0 0.1 um, milligrams per cubic meter, all of the way to this incredible bloom at 100 milligrams per cubic meter. And it is, is able to do that because of its incredible sensitivity and signal to noise ratio. So really just um, this image just really continues to blow my mind. Every time I look at it, I just, I'm really in awe of what ULCHI can achieve. And um, it measures a lot as with, was with all of the optical ocean color sensors I've talked about so far to one optical depth. And that is of course, dependent on what's in the water to begin with. Here's a beautiful animation of ULCHI at work. Um, it's collecting data um, over the earth um, at 300 meter resolution and one kilometer reduced granules. It is collecting data in 21 spectral bands. So in the RGB and the visible into the shortwave infrared, um, and as you can see, it's going over the UK now and it's collecting data right now, 
right now over this beautiful bloom in the Bay of Biscay. Um, and now it's moving over land. You can see it's not collecting data through the cloud. And because it is such a democratic sensor, it is now also provisioning uh, ocean color, uh, uh, color data over the land as well. And yet again, if I've managed to make it sound like this is a one solution um, for all problems, then I apologize, I've misled you because there are significant challenges to collecting data on ocean color with optical sensors. And the first one is that Earth is really cloudy. And I believe I'm right in saying that one of the most common responses to when people go into space for the first time, astronauts go into space for the first time, and they have this unbelievable opportunity to look back at our Earth. One of the first things they always say is, I can't believe how cloudy it is. Earth is cloudy, and that's a problem if you can't see through cloud. I'm gonna give you just a few seconds to look at this and figure out what that is. What do you think that could be? I'll give you a clue. That is what the world looks like to just one of the sentinels on a daily basis. Two challenges here. The first one is cloud and the second is swath gaps. But when you combine Sentinel 3A and B over the space of a single day, you cover those swath gaps, but you're left with significant cloud gaps. There is lots we can do to fix this. Um, so today is Wednesday. Is that right? Today is Wednesday. If I want to know what the global oceans looked like without such a big impact from cloud and with absolutely no impact from swath gap, I can convert data that was collected on, Mon I can merge data that was collected on Monday and Tuesday to give me a composite. And now we have no swath gaps, but again, lots of cloud. But I can continue to merge and merge and merge data from today, data from tomorrow, until I get weekly composites, monthly composites, seasonal composites. The only thing limiting me is what I'm trying to measure. And uh, if I'm lucky and the things I'm looking for are out in the bigger ocean and they're changing on very slow scales, then I can make composites of up to a week or a month. But this is not often the case, especially if you're working in the coastal zone where things change multiple times a day. But that's not our only challenge. We have solutions to it, but it's not our only challenge. The second challenge is that the Earth has seasons and latitudes. Now, this picture is amazing. Uh, Regina Falkenberg made a pinhole camera and she put it in an observatory near her university and then she proceeded to forget about it completely for eight years. And when it was found, it had collected eight years worth of data of the sun moving across the hemispheres. And so what we can see is what the sunlight path looks like in winter and in summer, because it is different. I'm going to demonstrate this in the best way I know how. Here is the Earth with an atmosphere floating in space. It is on an axis, which I've obviously greatly um, sort of exaggerated to illustrate its purposes. Here's me, I'm waving. I've also grossly exaggerated me for illustrative purposes. And if I am standing straight and there is, I'm imagining a line from me to the center of the Earth and I look straight up, that line goes straight through me I look straight up, I'm looking at the zenith. And in summer, even in the UK, I can anticipate the sun to be directly above me in summer at midday. Beautiful sunlight coming through the atmosphere. Um, but that's not always the case because in winter, as we saw from Regina's photo, the sun is not above my head at midday. It, it comes in at an angle to strike me in the eye as I'm cycling home. And that has a few implications. The first is that it has more atmosphere to travel through. And the second is that it creates the solar zenith angle. Now, if you're trying to see the bottom of a pond you, at night, you would shine the torch from the top to illustrate the bottom. If you shine it at an oblique angle, you're very unlikely to get the kind of penetration through the water that you want. And this is a very simple concept, but it's the same thing. You have more atmosphere to deal with, but you also have an oblique angle of light penetration to deal with, which means in winter, the data you're collecting is not, it should be flagged. And if you're able to account for this, um, then that's fine, but it, you need to be aware of it because if you're looking at data over the space of a year, you might think you're seeing something, but it is in fact an artifact because of the way the light is penetrating or not well penetrating the water. 
Um, and it's a significant amount of the earth that is affected by the solar zenith angle. So anywhere it's sort of north of Portugal, during winter months, you have to account for this high solar zenith angle. And if you're anywhere sort of south of Cape Town, that is true for the Southern Hemisphere winter as well. So this is a challenge if you're trying to get data collected on annual scales. Finally, I've mentioned the atmosphere, but it is in fact its own challenge all on its own. Um, the Earth having an atmosphere, and I sort of said this to you before, for optical sensors that are passive, light from the sun sort of comes through the atmosphere, it interacts with the Earth's surface, it bounces back, and it's about 2% of the original light that makes it back to the satellite. But we really do have to account from the contributions of Rayleigh scattering and, and other interactions and contributions from the atmosphere, because what we want is the signal called the water leaving radiance. So we do have to do atmospheric corrections. Now, if you're very lucky, you'll never have to do an atmospheric correction in your life because that's because data can be um, processed for you. Um, and it depends on the level of the data that you interact with. Now, you'll never interact with level zero data. But if you download and process level one data, it's gridded, it's beautifully formatted, but it will not have an atmospheric correction applied. That is something that you will have to do yourself. Now, this uh, does vary slightly between uh, different data providers, but in general, if you are using level two data, you are uh, using data that has an atmospheric correction applied. At level three, we're talking about data that has been merged in some way. So for example, um, the OCCCI, which uh, TJ and I'm sure Shiva will talk about um, during their talks, is the Ocean Color Climate Change Initiative Composites which merges data in order to get the longest possible time scale. So the sensors I've spoken about from NASA and from ESA are part of these climate change initiative, uh, the ocean color uh, composites in order to get the longest possible time series. And you'll hear more about that later. Um, and then at level four, we get gap filled product uh, data that has had model data um, included. And a very good example of this is primary productivity. And Bob Bruin is going to tell you more about that in his lecture. And of course, Ben Loveday is going to tell you a lot more about the data access at these different levels um, from different places as well. The nice thing about getting level two data from UMETSAT for ocean color is that you also, not only do you have data that have been atmospherically corrected, but they also compose the products for you. So you get two chlorophyll products, uh, the neural net and the OC4ME, uh, products like total suspended materials, gelb stuff, and PAR, um, which you know you can use or not use depending on your application. At level three, this is just um, you can obviously tell this is one of my favorites because I use the spinning globe in all of my talks multiple times. Uh, Thomas Jackson created it from the version five Ocean Color Climate Change Initiative product, and this is that merged product using different sensors. Um, and it is available to you for free as a daily, um, a five day or eight day composite or a monthly composite. And that goes back to 1997 using a lot of the instruments that I've talked about in this talk. And again, this slide, and I'm sorry, but this is just to remind you because I promise it's important and you will think back to the slide and you will say, okay, I remember and I thank you because we're going to now move from ecosystem monitoring to marine monitoring. And that's because we're now using terrestrial satellites to be to do a marine job. And the first satellite I'm gonna talk about for that is Sentinel-1. This is an awesome satellite. It collects radar data. So this is the first active satellite sensor that we're gonna be talking about in detail. Uh, it collects data at 10 meter spatial resolution. Again, we've now moved from 300 meter spatial resolution to 10, and that's because we're talking about primarily terrestrial sensors. It was launched, the first one was launched in 2014, and this is the perfect example of why having two at a time is amazing. Sentinel-1B regrettably stopped collecting data in 2021. We only have one radar satellite that we can use the data uh, freely now under the Copernicus program, um, and that had you know, big implications for data coverage, but at least we still have one. Um, they carry C-band synthetic aperture radar instruments, what Sentinel-1A does, and this is that active sensor I was telling you about. So not only can it collect data in most weather and through cloud, it can collect data at night. Again, mostly a terrestrial focus mission. And for those of us used to getting the in-water properties, you need to forget that now we're talking about only surface backscatter. 
The other thing, if you're used to data collected by sensors I've mentioned before, is that Sentinel-1 is not switched on all the time. And I apologize if this makes you feel a little classic. Uh, if it does, please rather focus on this little panel at the bottom with the yellow square. Sentinel-1A is, this is its path, um, and it is collecting data um, based on where it is switched on. And you can see it is switched on and switched off um, over different parts of the world. And it is collecting data in the marine environment, but mostly only because that marine environment happens to be next to land, um, very much a terrestrial sensor. But well worth the efforts of getting used to its uh, unique ways of collecting data, specifically for things like vessel detection, because it doesn't matter if you're doing something naughty at night, we can still see you from SAR. Uh, oil spill detection is a very, um, is a very useful application of SAR because of the way oil sits on the surface of the water and reduces the capillary waves. We're able to detect it as dark patches on an otherwise quite um, bright background. And because um, SAR data, particularly in VV polarization, is very um, sensitive to the ruffling of the surface of the water by wind, we can also extract wave and, and wind information from the SAR surface roughness. In areas of the world where clouds are a problem, specifically the poles, this is one of sometimes one of the only ways you can collect any data uh, throughout the year because um, of, of cloud and because of the solar zenith angle. It is also very important for inland and coastal flood monitoring. And more recently, it has been shown to be very good at picking up seaweed invasions. So this is Barbados and all of these bright objects against the gray background. I've tried to enhance it a little bit so it's easier to see. I hope you can see it almost looks like a stars against a dark background. But that is, in fact, an invasion of sargassum seaweed that during 2018 was unprecedented and caused a state of emergency for Barbados. So here is a really nice example of where we're used to these sensors for marine monitoring. But actually, this is more in the realm of ecosystem monitoring, too. Um, and because uh, of the high resolution and because it is ostensibly a terrestrial satellite, it is, of course, not just valuable to us for the oceans, but aquatic systems in general. Here's another invasive plant, this time a freshwater plant called water hyacinth that has invaded um, the Saigon River. And we can see it moving towards uh, Ho Chi Minh City in this thick rope of invasive plant um, in the Saigon River using Sentinel data, Sentinel in VV polarization in this example. That brings us to Sentinel-2. Uh, again, uh, not a marine mission, but has marine applications. You can derive ocean color from this instrument. Uh, it is another passive optical sensor. And I'm going to give you an example of some of the ways you can visualize what Sentinel-2 can do. And uh, this is one of my favorite things to do, is to look at the world through Sentinel-2 eyes. And what it has done here, it has taken data collected in the visible bands of light, in the red, the green, and the blue. It has put them together and recreated what we would have seen had we been flying over the Shandong province of China ourselves. But what is the first thing you notice? It's a little bit disappointing because it's hazy. Can't really see a lot, but don't worry. We're going to do an atmospheric correction together. Are you ready? There we go. Don't worry. It has now been atmospherically corrected at the push of the button. <laughs> if only it were that easy, right? Um, so here you can start to see a lot more detail. It is absolutely spectacular. Look at the beautiful swirls of sediment in the water. This is obviously quite complex waters. There's a lot going on, uh, lots of contributions from sediment. And, but can you start to see, I hope you can start to follow my mouth, and you can start to see there's something going on there, isn't there? There's something in the water that looks to be regular shaped all over the place, actually. And one of the nice things about Sentinel-2 is it collects data in the near infrared. And remember, I told you right in the beginning, near infrared light is really effectively absorbed by water. It doesn't penetrate past the skin. So water will look black and anything that isn't water is going to be bright in comparison. So why don't we take things from the visible into the invisible through Sentinel-2 through Sentinel eyes? Wow, suddenly you can start to see that on or at the surface of the water, there is a lot going on. These two boats, in fact, are not just moving towards the shore, they're moving in a channel. 
and what they're moving between are seaweed algae farms, macroalgae farms, where we have ropes, individual ropes that have been strung across that are growing macroalgae for, um, for food production. And they're absolutely everywhere in this image. But if we just rely on data in the RGB, that is really hard to see. And this is where the different bands start to really come into their own. I really love that. So the data goes back to 2015. Again, we have two sentinels acting as a constellation. It is a passive sensor that can't see through cloud. Uh, the optical data are actually collected at different spatial resolutions, um, but we don't need to worry about that right now. Suffice to say um, that we have Sentinel 2A and B acting together and um, collecting high resolution data predominantly over land. And it is an excellent sensor for what it was designed to do. Uh, its priorities are around land monitoring, but it has few bands. So we talked about Olchi, we said it had 21 bands. Sentinel 2's got 12. Um, and it doesn't have an excellent signal to noise ratio for that sensitivity that we managed to get out of Olchi. But it does have some strengths, uh, mainly based on its high spatial resolution. We can observe surface blooms. Uh, in fact, our background today is a cyanobacteria bloom that I think was observed by Sentinel-2 at high spatial resolution. Uh, we can mo monitor water quality. We can look at aquaculture farms like I just showed you in the Shandong province of China. Uh, whatever you see in radar, it's really good to, to do sanity checks or validate with Sentinel-2 wherever possible. Very valuable for mean spatial planning and for detecting floating debris. And again, because it is ostensibly terrestrial, you don't just have to do marine applications like ocean color in the ocean. You can also uh, extract uh, phytoplankton and chlorophyll in inland waters, thanks to this higher resolution. Um, I've got one more really cool image to show you. This is another example of how Sentinel-2 sees the world. Um, here we're going to do another atmospheric correction and go. There we go. Start to see things with much more clarity. There's some beautiful interactions between some fresh water and some ocean. Um, but we're not going to focus on that too much. I'm going to ask you to look in this little block over here. Um, and again, with how we saw in China, there's perhaps not a lot of anything to see. We're going to move like we did into the near infrared. And suddenly there's lots to see. There's a lot going on. And this is at the 10 meter resolution scale. So while we can't see exactly what's going on, we know something's going on. And this is perhaps where it's a good time to introduce the role of commercial satellites, because I certainly talked about them at the beginning and I'm going to mention them again now. So this is what data can look like at better than one meter resolution in the same band in the near infrared from commercial sensors. And you might be thinking to me, Lauren, why did you bother telling me about all of these other sensors, 300 meter resolution? I wanna see the world like this with perfect clarity. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not the way it works. The very important slide I said at the beginning, everything has a trade-off and never is that more true than when it comes to this kind of high resolution data. So I know it's tempting, trust me, I do. When you want to look at things at finer spatial scales, um, there is a temptation to move to very high resolution data, especially if you've got a lot of budget for commercial data. And here is an example that Haley put together uh, showing the difference between Sentinel-3 Ultra, the Sentinel-2 multispectral instrument, and satellite data from a commercial satellite called PlanetScope at three and a half meter resolution. And you might think, that's it, I'm done. I'm only using PlanetScope data from this point on. Be careful because of that trade-off. And this is very important when it comes to the spatial and spectral, particularly the spectral resolutions. So in the same space on the electromagnetic spectrum, where Sentinel-2 collects data in nine bands, Sentinel-3 has managed to cram in 21. And that is very, very important in, if you want to resolve things with more clarity and sensitivity. Whereas that commercial sensor I just showed you, I mean, it looked great, but you're lucky to get data in three or four bands. And more worryingly, for scientific applications, the signal to noise ratio as you go down in spatial resolution becomes worse. And maybe that's not so relevant for your application and that's okay. But for things like ocean color, particularly in complex waters, where you get something like this, you have to know what's inside. And in order to tease apart, to unmix what is causing the change in your ocean color from blue to green to red, 
it's important to know what is sedum, what is chlorophyll, and what is sediment, because you're trying to measure chlorophyll as the base of the marine food web to tell you many other things. And so having more bands at higher spatial sensitivity, sorry, high spectral sensitivity becomes very, very important. And again, I'm not saying commercial data isn't for you. I'm just saying that it has to be the right application for the tool to work well. There is a sweet spot for everything, but it is really important to remember for whatever you plan to do with your remote sensing data, resolution, resolution, and sensitivity. Those are the key concepts to remember. So I've drawn it back um, around to talk about um, the limitations and the trade-offs. Um, but please don't uh, let that put you off. There is nothing better for marine ecosystem monitoring than remote sensing. It is the very best tool that we have at our disposal for gathering overviews, for synoptic measurements at long time scales um, and at, at good spatial scales. Yes, trade-offs often need to be made, um, but that is very much dependent on your application and your workflow. All sensors, and in fact, I don't know any instrument for any scientific application that doesn't have strengths and weaknesses. And as long as you're aware of those and the challenges that impact data collection and accuracy, I think you're good to go. If you are interested in distinguishing climate change trends from long-term climate cycles, um, then merged sensor records become really important. And this is really the strength of the Ocean Color Climate Change Initiative, where we are getting data that is uninterrupted all of the way back to as early as we can get it. And as I said, TJ and Shubra, I'm sure, will talk more about that. Despite the imperfections, there really is no better tool for giving us the insight and understanding that we need of marine processes on everything from site-specific scales and dynamics to the global trends. And I really, really encourage you to go all of the way through this, through this course, of course, but for you to take what you've learned today and ensure that you attend the last module in order to be able to take what you learned today and find out how to access the data and process it using a number of tools that will suit your um, application and your workflow from Anna, Braw, Jeremy, Dave, and Gail. So really, please make sure that you don't miss those lectures in July. And they also include machine learning, which is a very important tool when you start to work with very large data sets. And um, I would like to end by saying thank you to you for your attention. I hope that was informative. I'd like to extend special thanks to Haley and Ben because they provided a lot of the slides, particularly on Sentinel-3, to Thomas, Stefan, and others at PML for contributing slides as well, and particularly to Shuba and Trevor because it was one of these lectures that I attended at the beginning of my career that turned me into a remote sensing scientist. As TJ said, I discovered remote sensing during my PhD and never looked back. And it was in a lecture just like this one with Shuba and Trevor at the helm that changed my career for the better. So thank you to them as well. Thank you very much, Lauren. <clears throat> hey, uh, I can see a lot of applause coming through and I think it's uh, well deserved. So uh, a very nice overview. And also I think a very nice, um, let's say teaser for the contents of the rest of the course. There's a lot of elements there that I think other people will uh, build on. Um, and uh, yeah, it just shows the great breadth of, of uh, applications and data available and things you can you can do. So very, very nice. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to questions, Q and A. Um, the way this will work, so um, we have had uh, a moderator busy taking all the questions from the chat and putting them into various topics, basically grouping them because uh, some of the questions uh, that have been asked are on similar things. Um, and so uh, now we can have a discussion where um, obviously, Lauren, you'll primarily be answering questions, I think, but we may pull in uh, other members of the panel. Uh, if, uh, if we think that's useful, they can raise a hand and, and speak freely. So um, a couple of questions first were about technical things. We had a lot of questions about, um, or about the lecture, really, um, whether or not things will be available. So I can answer those now. Um, we are recording this session and we'll be recording all the lectures. We plan to make them available later. There might be a delay in getting those uh, into a, a public uh, accessible form and kind of um, sanitized so we trim off any <clears throat> unrequired uh, recording. 
Um, so they will be available later, but there might be a delay. So that's why we're definitely encouraging people to come to all the sessions live. And also then you can get your questions answered. But if you have to miss one, um, you might be able to catch up on it. Uh, uh, not too, not too much delay because um, um, we record it. Um, so then um, there has also been a question about uh, attendance at the classes. I believe the WebEx is, has logged everyone that's attended. So and that's how we're taking attendance. So um, you don't need to fill in anything extra uh, or anything like that. Okay. So uh, if we pick one of the, the topics that we've had some questions on, um, there was a question about um, Sentinel uh, 1A, 1B. And there was uh, a query about um, how complementary or independent are they? Uh, and there was a question about why uh, we recently lost uh, one of the central ones, um, if you know about that, um, and how much of an impact that might have. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, Sentinel 1A and B both carried the same sensor. So it was the C band um, SAR sensor. Uh, so they were exactly the same. So they were collecting exactly the same data and filling in each other's gaps in the same way that Sentinel two and three do the same for each other. They're exactly the same sensors aboard the two satellites acting uh, in conjunction and complementing one another. I think one of the reasons that Sentinel-1B stopped communicating was a power issue. So for some reason, and, and actually what's really scary about this, sorry, small tangent uh, about space debris is Sentinel-1A a few years ago was hit by a very small piece of space debris on its, um, solar panels. So, you know, you normally you see these satellites and they've got these big wings. Those are their solar panels and that they generate their own energy in order to communicate with Earth and to stream data and to collect data, of course. And Sentinel 1A's panel was hit by a piece of space debris at like a million kilometers per hour and it dented the solar panel and it reduced ever so slightly the amount of energy being collected by the satellite. So everyone held their breath and it was very scary. But Sentinel 1A is safe. And then all of a sudden, Sentinel 1B lost the connection between power and communication. So we've never been able to get communication back up. I say we, I mean, the agency, uh, ESA, has never been able to reconnect with Sentinel 1B. And that has changed um, the coverage of the Earth by the SAR sensors. Um, it has reduced coverage unavoidably. The benefit of this is that ESA very, has been very agile and is now bringing up the launch of Sentinel 1C, which was due for later, um, they're bringing that forward so that we will yet again have two SAR sensors uh, in orbit at the same time. I hope that answers your question. I think that was quite comprehensive. Um, yes. <laughs> um, there's uh, while we're on the topic of sensors, the, there's another couple of uh, questions around uh, Sentinel 2. Um, so uh, there was a question to clarify the number of bands uh, Sentinel 2 has. Um, I think that's because you were referring to the fewer bands from Sentinel-2 compared to Sentinel-3. Yeah. Um, but obviously it depends over which spectral range you're looking at, right? Because it extends into the... Um... Into the shortwave infrared. So it's got two bands in the shortwave infrared. The thing is, as I said in the beginning, some of those bands are predominantly used for atmospheric correction, and they're not really considered bands that collect data that we would use for actual Earth observation. Um, so it's more um, that... The follow-up to that is there was a question about the procedure for atmospheric correction of Sentinel-2 images and uh, discussing the steps. Um, I don't know if we have time to go into a full discussion of atmospheric correction here. It's quite an arduous process. Yeah. Um, but, but I, would... uh, I did you want to outline the, the major steps that are required. Well, I can just say that there are a number of approaches and a lot of them are open source. Um, and the other thing that's really nice is, and Ben Loveday will talk about this as well, is that you don't have to do an atmospheric correction unless you have a really good reason to do one. It's probably unnecessary. And that is generically true. Unless you are in an area where the generic atmospheric correction that is applied is, is delivering data that you feel is not quite well enough corrected, um, I would say that there's no other reason for you to ever need to do an atmospheric correction yourself. And you can access level two Sentinel-2 data from the portal without having to do this yourself. But if you are interested in it, there are a number of um, open source, freely available atmospheric correction um, applications out there. And 
you know, you're welcome to get hold of me through Neodas or through PML, and we can talk about your data and atmospheric correction in detail. Okay. Um, if we move on, there was a number of questions about what satellites can measure, um, you know, different products, uh, things like this. Um, so um, there was a, um, a couple around um, pH and uh, salinity and things like this. So I don't know if you wanted to touch on those. I know the um, ESA had uh, a Pathfinders project, I think it was called, that was looking into ocean acidification and it yeah. pulled in data from multiple sensors. Yeah, I have personally not worked with SMOS or um, anything that uh, derives pH um, remotely myself. Um, I have, I, I guess I should have said this from the beginning, this is non-exhaustive. In that one slide that I showed you with all of the sensors that have been mapped as little dots, it just looks so crowded. Of course, that's it's not to scale. But there are so many different sensors out there measuring different parts of our Earth system. So from the atmosphere to, you know, to CFCs and carbon dioxide to sulfur dioxide to pH to salinity, there are all sorts of things that you can measure from space. Um, I haven't covered them all, but yes, they exist. I just haven't spoken about them. Sorry, I should have said this was non-exhaustive and there are uh, other I, products I think... available. If we were doing exhaustive, this would be much more than 17 lectures. We would go on and on and on. That's, that's the joy of this. There's so much and, to learn. But I think... And as I said, you can dedicate an entire career to one type of data set. Um, so it really is the sky. Oh, so low Earth orbits is the limit. Sorry, I'm terrible. Um, but I would recommend those people who had questions about pH um, potentially go and look up the Pathfinders uh, yeah. OA mission from, uh, or project from ESA. They had a good um, overview. They were producing uh, pH estimates. Uh, I believe it had a combination of um, THMOS, so that's the uh, moisture uh, and uh, surface conductivity satellite um, or sensor, uh, alongside uh, ocean color. And um, there may have also been some... Um, uh, data assimilation into models uh, going into that as well. So it's a really to get pH is quite complicated. So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but, uh, yes, there are estimates ongoing to try and estimate pH from in space. Okay, there was some moving on to a topic that is your specialty. There were some questions around <clears throat> surface uh, floating products or, or mm -hmm. objects. Um, so there was questions around the scale. Uh, what scales can you detect debris using Sentinel-2? Um, and also, how do you tell the difference between things like sargassum and large plastics and things like that? Okay, Oof. Uh, complex question. Very good question. Thank you for asking. Um, by scale, do you mean sort of how small or big do things have to be to be detectable? I assume... We had two questions actually. So okay. it, it, one is the scale of things you can detect, and the other is at what scale. So I think that means you know globally or regionally, can you map floating material? Okay, so this is a relatively new field. It's a, it's a few years old, and that's uh, just because Sentinel two is just a few years old or several years old. And um, and the data that we do use um, that we've been able to validate so far has shown that it's the size of the debris. Um, is so the 10 by 10 meter pixel that Sentinel-2 has as its limitation for spatial um, resolution needs to be filled by at least half. And there are very few individual objects uh, that you would be able to detect on the scales that aren't vessels. So you're relying on oceanographic processes, mesoscale processes like eddies or, or plumes or river fronts that gather those materials into patches. Um, and that those aggregations tend to be what are detectable from Sentinel-2. I have never in my career seen plain plastics uh, floating on the ocean surface. They're always combined with other sources of debris. So as, as we said, sargassum seaweed or other types of seaweed, uh, driftwood, sea foam, all of these natural materials tend to be aggregated by the same ocean processes to form these uh, patches that are then more easily detectable because they're filling pixels. Um, and that tends to be the way that we detect plastics. Uh, in terms of discriminating plastics from natural sources of materials, this is something that's still in progress. Um, the spectral signatures are different. Uh, we have very clear spectral signatures of things that we can measure a lot. So we get lots of data of sargassum, lots of data of driftwood, plastics that are validated not so much. 
but we're reliant on the differences in spectral signatures. And this is where machine learning really comes to the fore, um, where we're able to train it using all of the data at our disposal and then use that to help us classify what is and what is not anthropogenic and what is and what is not natural materials within a patch that is mixed. I hope that that answered the question sufficiently. I hope so. I mean, if it, if it hasn't, people are free to to uh, put that in the Ask chat. Ask again. But, um, yeah. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, and I will just say one thing. Um, certain materials are more detectable than others. So fishing nets, the one thing we really want to detect well, very, very tricky to see, even if they're so big that they're for more than 50% of a pixel. So not all materials are equal in terms of detectability either, which complicates things. Um, we've had a couple of questions about um, is Sentinel-2 data publicly available? As far as I know, yes, everything is. All of the data are publicly available. available. All of it are free to use. And um, please make sure that you attend Ben's talk because he's going to be talking about data access in greater detail. Um, but for now, really, just Google Sentinel-2 data access. It should take you to the ESA hub and you should be able to. And if anyone tries to charge you for data, you're in the wrong place. The data are free and you can access it at level one or level two. Please do access it at level two, and you can go anywhere in the world that that's collected data. Um, there's a few questions around uh, future sensors and the future uh, of uh, remote sensing. Um, one around what's the latest on hyperspectral and geostationary satellite missions. There's another one about do you know uh, the uh, resolution that PACE is intending to have? Um, and one about um, are there current efforts in ESA to make ocean color sensors of higher resolution, like the land based ones um, for mapping coastal ecosystems. So there's a lot of things there about spectral and spatial resolutions, where we are and where we might be going. So I don't know if you want to, if you have a, any insights you could uh, share on that. I'm now seriously regretting not adding the animation from the NASA visualization studio of altimetry through the ages. Because with every generation of new sensor in space, we get improved sensitivity and in, improved spatial sense, uh, spatial resolution and include and improved spectral sensitivity as well. So with every step change that we make in technology, we put the latest and the greatest in space. Um, and so I would say that the trade-off is still very important for marine based sensors. Um, and I think why do why would you need to observe these broad oceans at 10 meter spatial resolution? There's no benefit to looking at these broad macro to mesoscale processes at high resolution. It's there's no real benefit to that. So really I think for ocean color sensors, the 250 meter to 300 meter spatial resolution is actually the sweet spot already. The improvements there are going to be around sensitivity and perhaps uh, addition of bands. Um, as we, you know, uh, as you say, moving towards the hyperspectral um, uh, sensors, there are hyperspectral sensors already that are collecting data at 30 meter spatial resolutions. Um, I haven't really spoken about hyperspectral data um, at all, actually. Um, but for example, the Italian space agency's Prisma collects data that you can apply to get for free. Um, it's, you know, th there are hyperspectral data missions that are now being launched by NASA. So I think that was about the PACE mission. And I think that's at 30 meter spatial resolution. I stand to be corrected. And for example, SWAT is now collecting data at much higher resolutions for altimetry and is also collecting radar data. So NASA is now also contributing to the next generation of sensors. Um, yeah, I, I believe um, the specifics on PACE were, if I'm not mistaken, the intent is a one kilometer spatial resolution okay. and a five nanometer spectral. Okay. So yeah, wow. provide yeah hyperspectral is going to be every five nanometers through the whole four hundred to seven hundred. So amazing. Um, but as you said, they've they're aiming for a one kilometer spatial resolution okay. because once you get into the open ocean, um, you know that's that's enough to see the the bigger scale processes. Absolutely, things in the open ocean are huge. You don't need to resolve them in using small scale. Okay, uh, let's find another set of questions. Uh, there were plenty. <laughs> um, there were some questions around um, uh, some of the product accuracy. Uh, so chlorophyll was, there was a question about how accurate uh, chlorophyll measurements are with respect to measurements in the field. Well, um, TJ, I think you are 
far more qualified to answer that. Yeah, I mean, okay, I, I'll take that. The one. expert in uh, the room. So, uh, so the the requirements from uh, there's a body called GCOS, which is the Global Climate Observing System uh, Group, and they say that for chlorophyll products to be useful, they should have, have an accuracy of at least thirty percent. Um, currently, we tend to be achieving this. There are always situations where the algorithms fail. Um, when you apply these uh, uh, algorithms um, across the globe, uh, each water type, atmospheric condition, um, even time of year and viewing angle and things all go into the quality of the output of the data. So the best thing really to do is to look for products where you have an uncertainty estimate or a, a quality assigned to those pixels values. So not only do you know, okay, I've got a chlorophyll of 20 milligrams, but uh, the estimate from those people who've produced it uh, says that that should be accurate to either some percentage or some absolute value. Um, but generally, we we aim to and we achieve uh, the, the GCOS requirements of being within uh, 30 percent. Obviously, that 30 percent scales uh, with the absolute concentration. So we have to be more precise uh, at lower concentrations. And for those of you who are interested in seeing this for yourself, I think it's Anna's talk at the uh, in the last module where you are able to look at data visualization using SNAP which is a platform that has an architecture designed for all of the Sentinel data visualization tools. Um, and you can observe the satellite data with flags. So you can start to see the accuracy of each pixel yourself um, using Snap. And Python, I think Braw's doing that. There was a question I'm not sure of. Uh, maybe you know, I'm not sure. Uh, if not, Son might be able to uh, be better in lecture um, four uh, because it's a question to NOAA. It's about the NOAA Dimioff chlorophyll A data that's currently available at nine kilometers, and someone wants it at one kilometer like CCI. I'm not aware of that. Um, I don't know if you are, but if not, we can ask Son if that's uh, available. We can save that question for him later. Yeah, absolutely. If if that is the data that you want, I mean. Um... If it was originally collected at higher spatial resolutions and then provided at a reduced resolution for whatever reason, there should be a way for you to access it, perhaps at a different level, level one, in which case some processing needs to be done. Um, but certainly if it was collected at higher spatial resolutions, you should be able to access it. And I don't know about it, but yeah, perhaps Son is the person you've uh, assigned to that task. <laughs> Yeah. Um, it seems uh, since I last looked at the question about what satellites can measure, we've had a few more things come in. About the what? Um, so about, about what, what satellites, satellites can measure. measure. Okay. So, so uh, there's been a few questions around mangroves and seagrasses mm -hmm. uh, and whether or not using uh, NDVI or the NVII um, for calculating mangrove productivity. So I was just wondering if you could talk about uh, any of those sorts of coastal or mangrove um, mapping. Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, we're talking about small scale things that we're looking at, but Landsat, Sentinel-2, and drone-borne multispectral to hyperspectral data are very commonly used for mangrove and seagrass mapping intertidally, uh, the, the seagrasses. Again, we're talking about stuff at the surface of the water or just on the edge in the coastline. Stuff that is, um, things that are submerged below a certain depth are going to be invisible to the satellite sensors. We can only, a lot of them can only see towards to one optical depth, and so, Anything subsurface, deep chlorophyll maxima, submerged seagrass beds um, are not going to be visible to the sensor. But um, yes, Landsat and Sentinel 2 um, have really shown their worth for mapping seagrass extent, uh, recovery, productivity, and health, and the same for mangroves as well. Uh, again, this is already in the realm of machine learning. So, Mangrove Watch has actually provided some masks for. Um, uh, machine learning for automated mangrove detection and monitoring. So it's it's a very nicely established field, and it is a very good application of those sensors for that that application. Yeah. Um, there's been a few questions come in around. I'm, I also should uh, again welcome the rest of the panel to to raise a hand if they want to to chip in. I know yes, please, please. Got, <laughs> she was definitely got some expertise on the, some of these topics. Um, this one, these well, there's a couple of questions around um, suspended sediments, and um, can you measure them using ocean color remote sensing, and and how do you go about it? Yeah, does anyone else want to want to answer that? I'm I'm happy to. It's um, it's a complex question. 
Yeah, so spectrally, uh, chlorophyll and sediment do look quite different. Uh, it's tricky when they're mixed. Um, but certainly, if you're looking at sediment plumes, um, you can do so using Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 Ulchi. Um, and the sediment changes the water color in dramatic ways. Um, and like I showed you in that um, image from the floods in Florida last year, those sediment plumes were 20 kilometers long. They were massive, um, and that was an image from Sentinel-2 during a gap in the clouds, um, and I was indeed tracking those sediment plumes just using um, Sentinel-2 in the RGB. But spectrally, uh, sent, uh, sediment and chlorophyll do look different, and you are able to tease them apart if you have very high sensitivity, high signal-to-noise ratio, the kinds of things that Olchi can offer you, for example. Yeah, so I, I mean, they obviously they have fundamentally different properties in scattering is a big one. Yes. Um, so the, the sediments scatter a lot. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, okay. I think. Well, so I think you may have answered this. There was a question about, or it may have been on your slides. Wanted to know if the data from Sentinel two can be used for detecting marine debris. And the effect of marine debris acting as a source of introduction of invasive species. So I guess that would be tracking. Yes. So the thing about Sentinel 2, like Sentinel 1, it's not switched on all the time. So you can have a source and you can have a sink. But if it's traveling across an entire ocean basin, you're going to need to track with something that collects on daily scales over the ocean basins, like Olchi. And if you're um and, and potentially the use of circulation models to understand where things may be going until you can pick them up again nearer to the coastline. Um, and this is the thing, it's a terrestrial satellite, Sentinel-2 or terrestrial satellites collecting data in coastal zones. And so if the material you're tracking um, moves very quickly or moves across outside of the coastal zone, it's then you're then going to need different sensors to do the job. The other thing that's worth remembering is um, that trade-off temporarily Sentinel-2 is collecting data every two to five days, depending on where you are in the world. And as I said, if your aggregation of debris moves very quickly with, for example, the tides or with a, with a rapid coastal sort of process after a storm, it's going to be gone in a day. And if Sentinel-2 doesn't collect on that day, or if it moves really quickly between um, overpasses, you might miss it. So Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 acting in conjunction to hopefully detect and track what you're looking at. But as soon as it moves out of the coastal zone, um, data coverage is stopped. So it is tricky. Um, there's a couple of questions, <clears throat> again, around um, kind of questions about what we can and or, or could, or the ways we can think of tracking uh, things. So one is, uh, about tracking ocean biodiversity. So I know that there are ESA projects um, uh, called Beacom and Booms, which are currently looking at trying to map uh, biodiversity or um, ecological provinces uh, using multiple types of remote sensing data. So that's um, both chlorophyll or ocean color, but also um, sea surface temperature data, looking at things like fronts uh, and, and other features. Um, so, yes, the ocean color approach can assist in tracking biodiversity, but I think assist is the right word there. It's yeah. part of a, uh, a bigger picture. A lot of the times, um, I'm sure you'll agree, Lauren, uh, the, the big questions we have to answer, we actually have to pull in across. It's not about having one golden solution. Uh, and as you very clearly stated, it depends on the scale of what you want to observe, the time, series, time scale you want to observe it over, how easy it is to detect, you know, if you have the right bands or the right spectral features. Um, so there was a question around, um, is there, or can you suggest a method to map salinity intrusion, for example? Um, because this can be a problem uh, in the places like the Mekong Delta. Yeah. So I think, I don't know if I'd want to speculate a, an easy or a quick solution to that off the top of my head, but I think the, the way you would go about it is trying to look at what your detectable signal might be yeah. Are you having some change in the vegetation at the surface because it's poisoned by salt? Mm. Are you having some color change because of the salt coming through at the, the surface layers? Is there a, I don't know, um, does the precipitation of salt raise the the sediments, like physically lift them and you get an altimetry change? There's all yeah. sorts of things. You have to think about what the signal you want to detect yeah. and then go from there. So, yeah, um, what do yeah, you do? 
Yeah, if I can add to that. So what TJ is talking about there is proxies. So, for example, if the thing you want to look at is really tricky to see or not possible to see from remote sensing, however, it gives clues to other things. So what TJ was saying is, does the ex does the fresh water or salt water, do they have different colors? Can you look at that intrusion by saying that the salt water, for example, is more blue than the, the water from the Mekong Delta, which has more sediment in it? Um, the altimetry is a really good one as well. Um, so you look for proxies that tell you about the thing that you're trying to measure. And that's very common as well. In fact, um, I think that, that's, yeah, that's a very common approach and a very clever approach to look at the things around the variable you're trying to measure directly. Um, the other thing I will say is the question about ecosystem um, mapping is one for the ages. I highly recommend looking at Longhurst provinces as well. Um, this, this really does go back, but it is highly, highly relevant. And it's something that obviously the remote sensing community wants to contribute to as much as possible. It is a tool that can be used to enhance the sort of um, approach and effort. I would definitely welcome Shuba to talk about provinces and, and uh, distinguishing regions of the ocean if she wants to. Yes. <laughs> True expert. Yeah, I think uh, Tom and uh, Lauren are talking about the concept of ecological provinces in the ocean. And uh, one of the key seminal works in this area is that of uh, Dr. Alan Longhurst. But um, the contribution that uh, remote sensing can bring to the debate is to map the dynamic nature of these provinces. Unlike uh, ecological biomes or provinces on land where they stay put, the ocean ecosystems are constantly moving. And so the only way really to monitor their uh, dynamics is through remote sensing. But once again, I would emphasize what Lauren has said throughout and also Tom during the discussions, that is, we do have to recognize that satellites and ocean color and all the other related SST and all those sensors, they contribute to the study, but we should not treat them as the perfect all seeing solution for everything. Uh, while we have you, Shuba, there was a there was a question that's just come in about um, the uh, potential of a proxy for fecal bacteria or, uh, detection in in tourist regions. I mean, you, there is a whole module on human health. I assume that we'll be yeah. going into more details of things like that there. Um, right, so yeah. I, I would recommend uh, tuning in for that one to get a full uh, full descript discussion of um, uh, uh, of those sorts of proxies. Yeah. Um, that would be the best because we do have a whole module on the topic. Mm. But remember that Lauren also showed how temperature anomalies can be used to track the prevalence and the risk from certain types of uh, Vibrio bacterium. You will see more examples, including uh, Vibrio cholerae bacteria when it comes to the module related to human health. So wait for that module for more details. Um, there are a couple of questions, Lauren, relating, I think, to your slide around penetration depths of different uh, light mm -hmm. uh, bands. And so there was a question that said, uh, what does one opti optical depth mean in terms of meters? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, an open question. I mean, that's uh, it depends, <laughs> but no. I'll let you go into detail on that. And there was another okay. one saying that we have a, DC, a DCM in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Do you think that the ocean color data is reflective of a DCM or, you know, can we see DCMs? So I think I'll, I'll let you talk on that. Oh, I just, I love these two questions. So, first of all, I remember when I came to remote sensing, not understanding this optical depth question. So I'm going to do what Haley did for me. We sat next to each other and she went, all right, I'm going to explain it to you. And she did such a good job of it. So if I don't do it well, um, I've failed Haley, and I'm sorry. But basically, if you have very clear water, like in the gyres where they, what did I call them? The equivalent of a marine desert. 
If you have nothing in the water, no phytoplankton, no sediment, they're in the middle of nowhere, the light is going to penetrate really deeply and the satellite will be able to see deeper than, for example, in a river that's full of mud. And so you yourself measure to one optical depth when you look for the bottom of a river to look for stones or to look for fish. If you are looking and you can see the bottom of the water, that means that the water is clear and you can see to your optical depth to see the to, to see the stones and whatever it is that you're looking for. But if you're trying to decide if you want to jump into a murky lake for a swim and you can't see further than that because there's so much suspended sediment, that's your optical depth. And you might think twice about wanting to jump in because you can't see what's underneath. And so you don't know what you're about to jump on top of. And it's the same for satellites. Like our eyes, they're limited by what is suspended in the water. And if there's very little, they'll be able to see deep. And it's in meters, certainly in the gyres. I don't want to tell a lie, but I seem to recall being astounded by the light penetration in the gyres. It was in the meters, um, that one optical depth. Whereas again, in waters where you're having a really intense bloom or you've got lots of suspended sediment, just like with your own limited eyes, you're not going to be able to see further than that or that or that because of how much is in there. So then it is measuring a few centimeters versus a few meters in the gyre where the water is clear. I don't know if I good, did a good job of that, but that is how I remember learning about it and saying, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the I mean, it, it, was... it, definitely in the gyres, I think uh, the, the optical depth um, is, is up to tens of meters for some wavelengths. So, I mean, the, yeah. the DCM that's Absolutely. just been mentioned, yeah. the DCM uh, is usually uh, found around the 1% light level. So your, your light at the depth of that is 1% of the surface, and that can be 100 meters yeah. um, or, or more in the, in the clear waters of the gyres. So, yeah, it's, um, as you say, it varies over orders of magnitude from centimeters in very, very turbid waters to, to meters, many meters uh, in the clear, clear ocean. So, yeah, Absolutely, definitely. and and um, deep chlorophyll maxima, you know, it's it's known that a lot of these ocean color sensors are missing the deep chlorophyll maxima. So we're not really able to account for their contribution to productivity, to, to the carbon cycle. So we know about what we don't know, if that makes sense. It's not an unknown uh, entity. We know that we're missing them. Um, but there are other ways of observing them using in situ data, but also um, there is the potential for LIDAR sensors. So Calypso, for example, uh, is a sensor that's designed for weather. Um, but some uh, someone at MIT used Calypso data to look for thin scattering layers of chlorophyll um, of phytoplankton. So there is certainly scope, and I know that uh, Bull Aerospace are working on a marine lidar sensor for for penetrating the, the ocean to look for um subsurface phenomena like the chlorophyll maxima um, and that's very exciting and that sort of feeds into what we were talking about about the next generation of sensors really it is about technology um and and making up the technology and then being able to put it in space so if, just in case because again I'm, I'm not sure how many of the the attendees might understand the concept of lidar so that's a, an active sensor because as we're saying the signal coming from those depths is so low the yeah. idea is to shine a very intense laser down into the water and look at what bounces back right yes i specifically didn't say space laser <laughs> <That's what laughs> it is. it's a space laser uh, a very at, at, at as low as possible intensity to look to penetrate the water um, as deeply as possible in order to find those otherwise uh, invisible deep chlorophyll maxima. So that's a really good question. Um, and I really like talking about deep chlorophyll maxima and optical depth. So thank you for that. Um, I, I think we're getting, we're starting to run out of questions now, but there are a few left. Um, there was one asking, it was based on your final slide with the beautiful swirling image. Mm -hmm. um, and it said, could you introduce some um, application of high resolution ocean color data for studying sub mesophysical processes? So I think that's, a you know, can, can you talk a little about um, these features we can capture and, and how we might use ocean color data to inform us about the physical processes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on broad scales, that is very much true using the ocean color to show you how things are circulating to see ocean fronts in the ocean color as well. 
particularly in the Southern Ocean, um, that works incredibly well where you see uh, you, you expect things to be really well mixed and they're quite distinct along the fronts. Um, on smaller scales, definitely we can see some mesoscale features like eddies and uh, fronts um, oftentimes, but they're very transient. Um, it was, and von Kármán vortices, sort of downstream of islands in fast moving waters, you're able to pick those up as well. That obviously has real implications for mixing, uh, for nutrient uh, recharge, um, and, you know, everything, uh, the, the, the sort of downstream phytoplankton dynamics. Um, and of course, those features are often targeted by seabirds and other animals because at France you have productivity because you have this upwelling of nutrients and constant recharging of the waters. So yes, it is very important. Um, you can derive a lot from the oceanographic processes by seeing what has followed on in the biology. Um, again, though, those features are often very transient um, and it's about capturing it at the right time. So if the overpass matches with what you're trying to look for, absolutely. Um, and with Sentinel-1 as well, with the internal waves, that's a really that's another really nice example of catching the oceanography and sort of what's happening underneath uh, the von Kármán vortices, the fronts, the, the eddies. Yes, these are all things that we can see. And in fact, in that Da Nang, uh, da Nang image, the one in Vietnam where I showed you the RGB moving into the near infrared for the, the farms, the, the small farms that were in the bay there, um, that submesoscale feature was stunning, but I've never seen it again. Uh, that is the one and only time I've seen it and um, I've looked for it. And it just seemed to either be transient and Sentinel-2 always keeps missing it, or it was just a one-time thing and I was lucky enough to capture such a beautiful eddy. Um, so, yeah. Um, there's a question about the, and I, I mean, it's a short question with a big answer, I think. What's the best yeah. observing system for monitoring harmful algal distribution? Oh, I'm going to say Ulchi, and like I might be biased, but I I do I think it's Ulchi. Um, anyone else's? I mean, Chema, you you must have something to say there. Uh, Shuba, I don't know. Please feel free to jump in. I'm biased. I love Sentinel three. So, is that because of the the spectral bands needed for identifying the different phytoplankton groups? You think? Or... Yeah, and and that sensitivity is just beautiful. Really, quite unmatched. But if you know, I'm I'm happy to admit my bias, and if anyone has anything else to say, they're welcome to jump in. I think I just add what you've been iterating all this time. It really depends on what you want to use it for, where you yeah. are, resolution and resolution and things yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really like that slide. <laughs> yeah. Um. I, I mean, that that uh, that does, there's a question uh, that says, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, and there was a question around the limitations of remote sensing and coastal monitoring. Now, we we do have a whole lecture on coastal pro coastal monitoring from yeah. um, SON, uh, mm -hmm. from NOAA, mm -hmm. uh, in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. um, which will go into more detail of, of what you can measure and, and the difficulties of coastal waters. Um, but they ask on two topics regarding pixel size and land mixing. Um, yes. And, and phytoplankton community shifts quickly during the day, you know, those sorts of near shore processes uh, and just kind of, uh, I think, ask for a little clarity on the limitations that we do have. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky. You're quite right. Um, you know, when we talk about a 300 meter resolution, you're talking about go for a walk and walk in one direction for 300 meters then turn around and do a square 300 meters, 300 meters, 300 meters. And within that pixel, what you're assuming is relative uniformity because that one pixel is your point measurement. And if it's contaminated by land, you can't use that pixel because it's going to be really tricky to unmix. So it's easier often to say we have a nine, like a three to nine kilometer gap around coastlines where we understand that the data are flagged or problematic or we can't get as much sensitivity or as accuracy as we would like. Um, but of course you want the sensitivity and the spectral resolution as well. And so you're now limited by your spatial resolution, right? Um, you could then say, well, I'll use Sentinel-2, um, but now you've got 12 bands, low signal to no like a, a less good signal to noise ratio, less sensitivity. And so are you deriving accurate ocean color measurements from that sensor? It's tricky. 
Um, this is where Bob Bruin's efforts at uh, instrumenting surfers, surfing boards, gosh, Lauren, where has my language gone? Surfboards um, has um, was absolutely a game changer because just for fun, surfers were going out and collecting in situ data while they were surfing, and that data was improving the data we were able to get around those coastlines. Um, but really, and I think I, I didn't mention in si the value of in situ validation enough in this talk. And actually, if I, you know, when I do it again, that's something that I will correct. But in situ data is essential for validation and never is that more true than along coastlines where we really struggle. It's a, as you said, it's a short question with a very big answer. It's very complex. Oh, mute. Yeah, that works. Um, there was a there was a question. I don't know if you've been involved in anything with this. I think there were some studies with NPML, or there is a light pollution. But there was a question about: Are there any sensors that are able to monitor light pollution? Yes, it's VERS, and it's amazing. So, for example, in South Africa, if you want to look at the activity of what is chaka in normal language, squid. Squid fishing boats use these big lights, right? So they go out at night, they have these huge lights and um, that attracts the squid to the surface and then they can catch the squid. Um, and you can see those lights in VERS data. So you can actually track the, the fishing patterns, which tell you more about, so here we go, proxy. You can't measure squid from space, but you can look at the predators of squid. And these happen to have giant lights on them and they're boats. So if you if you track the fishing boat positions, when they turn their lights on and they stop to fish, you're assuming that they have reached grounds where there is enough prey for it to be worth stopping to feed, using this predator analogy, right? And so you can track the squid by tracking the lights of the boats with furs. So yes, uh, in a nutshell, sorry, I got very excited there. I just, um, the night lights data from VERS is beautiful. VERS is a NOAA satellite. Um, and I didn't talk about it at all in, in, in this lecture, but it's a great satellite um, and it collects ocean color data, but light data at night as well. Um, we've had another question. I'm gonna uh, kind of partly kick into a future lecture. So there's there's been a quick question around the difference between OCCCI and, and glob color chlorophyll data. Mm -hmm. um, the differences there are around um, the, the number of steps that have been done uh, and uh, with respect to making the data climate quality and, and also the algorithms used to derive the chlorophyll. So um, I won't go into a full breakdown here, but if you tune into my lecture later on climate data, um, there will be an overview of all the various things you should and shouldn't do uh, when trying to create climate data sets. Um, I don't like to necessarily get into into um, heated discussions around the differences, but um, yeah, the, there are steps within the CCI for intersensor bias correction that, as far as I know, are not included in club color. So, um, within this uh, group, um, there's been a, 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 some work for trying to make sure that that OCCCI record is as consistent across the whole record as possible. Um, but anyway, tune in for the climate data lecture for more on that one. Um, there is a, a question for you, Lauren, definitely. Um, that was about, um, well, I mean, you and, and others, many, many of us, um, which says, is it easy to quantify or enumerate phytoplankton using remote sensing? Hmm. Yes and no. Um, so, oh gosh. So the packaging of chlorophyll is also variable. Um, and so, and. It also can depend on the composition of the species of your bloom. But oh, I feel like I'm not the most qualified to answer this question in oh, perhaps detail. Maybe, maybe we can hand over to Shuba. I mean, my, my yeah. input would be it's, it's easy or well, relatively easy, or we know pretty well uh, how to get chlorophyll estimates, which is a, obviously a pigment that's um, present in all phytoplankton. It's ubiquitous, um, but the ratios between, say, that that chlorophyll and the carbon content of or total carbon of the phytoplankton, or the number of cells, can be wildly different depending on yeah. if you have big diatoms or small Prochlorococcus. And usually, what it comes down to at that point is modeling, um, or some relationship between or empirical relationships between 
concentrations and uh, phytoplankton size or the optics and the size and their properties. So, I mean, Shuba, feel free to, to expand on that. But um, my summary would be in the bulk, yes, we yeah. can get chlorophyll, which is, is driving phytoplankton, but the specifics get difficult. Uh, to go from the bulk uh, quantity, such as chlorophyll, to the number of phytoplankton is not straightforward, but a number of uh, methods have been proposed to do that. But as in uh, many of these instances, to do that translation, you have to make assumptions. The common assumption that is made to achieve that is uh, related to the size spectrum and its structure. Oswaldo mm -hmm. sitting here has looked at uh, bacteria uh, scattering by particles and they, the scattering properties spectrally and in magnitude change with the size structure. In the same way, Lauren mentioned the packaging effect, which depends on size. So you could exploit all these with certain assumptions about the size structure to get at particle numbers. Uh, there are a few methods from different schools that have been proposed to handle that problem. Thank you. Um, there was, sorry, do you want okay. No, I just wanted to um, say thank you. I felt unqualified to answer that properly. <laughs> You're not unqualified, Lauren. There's just potentially people that have a longer experience in those topics, but you're not unqualified. Um, so there was a question around, have you ever worked with deep ocean observation, uh, which is apparently uh, a data set collected from below the ocean surface? Um, and Or do you know of any work that's tried to correlate results between uh, deep ocean and earth observation data? I mean, obviously, there's been there's been some work uh, or extensive work done linking things like the Bio Argo and Argo programs yeah. to remote sensing. I'm not personally familiar with deep ocean observing, but uh, I don't know if you are. I mean, the very deep ocean. If we're talking about the benthic environment at four thousand sort of meters, you know, several kilometers of depth, um, there is. Um, Quite a disconnect, I would say, by with what's happening at the surface and what can be happening directly below it. If you're talking about deep ocean to the mixed layer depth or deeper than that, um, bio argo definitely collecting fluorescence data, salinity, and temperature data, as well as um, other variables. Um, for my PhD, I collected ocean variables like fluorescence, light, salinity, and temperature from a seal with a tag on his head in the Southern Ocean. Um, and my little my little army of seal lasers. Um, and that collected data down to 2000 meters. Um, and I was using that to look at the fronts over a period of 10 years, um, which had been shifting thanks to perturbations brought about by changes in the southern annular mode, which is linked to ENSO. But the point is that that data, um, that deep data was linked to the remote sense data in some ways, but in other ways, it was really only the top five meters that ended up being really relevant when it came to validating the ocean color data in one of the cloudiest regions on Earth, where merged products are an absolute necessity at sort of one to four kilometer resolution with a point measurement from a seal head, um, so all of it was complex. But um, yes, there are there are lots of studies that are linking sort of these sorts of point measurements with the remotely sensed data um, in the oceans and in inland waters as well. Um, but it is it, it I, when you say deep ocean, I immediately think of benthic environments, and I think um, there's there's still a disconnect there certainly. I'm sort of speaking outside of my comfort zone there. I'm not entirely. No, that's, that's, I, was, I think the question was more just about, you know, how much um, uh, interaction there is between, you know, the surface measurements and deep. And I, 
you know, we, we do try to incorporate in situ measurements when we're looking at things. I mean, as, as was discussed around optical depths and things like that, you know, if we want to validate our light penetration models in the surface ocean, you know, we can go and look at um, profiles and things like that. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say what's really interesting is, um, yes, we use a lot of in situ data for validation of the satellite. Um, what I ended up doing for the seal data was realizing that the satellite data was quite consistent whereas the in-between tag data was not, and I ended up using the satellite data to validate the seal tag data. So in-situ data is not perfect either. Okay. Um, I'm, I, I'm conscious that uh, we are getting towards two hours uh, for this, this session, and I think after that, I think people will be starting to, um, to, to lose energy. So uh, yeah. and we're getting towards the end of the questions uh, now. So uh, just the last couple. Um, one is, um, well, what are some of the future trends in remote sensing technology and how will they impact our ability to study the oceans, such as new sensors, mapping or modeling techniques? I mean, the technology is the limit, right? I also think though, that there is a temptation to put just about everything in space. So these sort of dove satellites, these suitcase size sensors that are going up all the time. Um, so there's a, just a bit of a cautionary tale because I think I've sort of covered a little bit about the future of remote sensing in that we're always seeking to improve spatial spectral um, and temporal resolution and sensitivity. So whatever sensor is part of the next generation, it will be an improvement inevitably on what came before. Um, but all of these small sensors that are being put into space now, I will say is a bit of a cautionary tale with land with Sentinel 1A as an example. Um, their space is becoming quite busy. And a lot of the space, uh, the science satellites we're talking about now have deorbiting programs. They they will come out of orbit and they will, you know, they will fall out of orbit and um, not be left as junk. Um, and some of the Starlink, hypothetically, for example, satellites um, do not have those capabilities and are they are not interested in moving out of the way of science satellites, which are serving the entire global community. So um, there is a temptation to put everything that's new in space. But as a cautionary tale, I would also just say the pace at which the scientific community is putting sensors in space is good it's keeping up it's it's really rapid and evolving um and yeah yeah technology is evolving quickly and so are the new generations of sensors sorry i yeah, think i mangled I, that a little I bit think, no that's why I, I i i think that's that's quite clear i think as you say you've you've shown slides and talked about you know um future sensors having higher spatial higher spectral uh, and with uh, constellations, potentially higher temporal resolutions. Um, but obviously, I think there's we have to distinguish between um, what you might call test missions and operational missions. So things yeah. like the Sentinels are going up as operational. The data is intended immediately to be extremely useful to the, you know, of good quality versus some of the other sensors might be considered to, or the future ones we're seeing come up. Uh, might be considered to be testing, you know, pushing the limits. Yeah. So we hope we can make really nice uh, uh, scientific discoveries from them, uh, but those are still in the experimental phase. So I think it's useful to, to distinguish those two. The other thing I think um, you you talked uh, about uh, later lectures that we have on things like machine learning, and that's the other thing is it's the fusion of of let's say on the ground technologies, you know, things we're doing with the data. Um, that I think are giving us not only new power alongside the new missions, but new power with the old data that we had. Yeah, so we're well better said. able to do things, be that gap filling, be that uh, trend detection, be that segregation of images and identification of objects, whatever it is, we can go back over the good records that we have going mm. back to eight, even the eighties and start to apply um, novel processing techniques. Uh, and and modeling and uh, and and we've only touched on really things like reanalysis where the data is fed into um, earth system models. 
Yeah. Um, but all of that is growing and developing. So it's a really exciting field. And I think one thing I would say personally around ocean color um, that I've found very uh, interesting is some of the sciences that people study, you know, physics and things, they were founded hundreds of years ago. And, you know, although we draw on, on, on physics for optics and those sorts of things, our science, this, this remote sensing of the oceans really began from satellites in, as you said, the 70s. Mm. So it's all new and there's a lot to do. Um, so there's a yeah. lot of, you know, we need all these people to become scientists and help us. Yeah. Uh, or develop and, and, and push, the, push the field forward in their own areas. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot to do. I really like what you said there. There have been a lot of questions about the future of these missions. What new things, new, 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 new. Guys, the satellite record going back is beautiful. There is so much still to be discovered in the data we already have. Petabytes of data that has been collected that is operational, scientifically excellent. Um, you know, and, and I love what, what TJ and Shiva are doing as well with the Ocean Color Climate Change Initiative, taking these records, merging them, um, to the best possible quality so that we can actually start to look for trends that are related to climate uh, perturbations. Um, so really, I think, yes, there's going to be great new things, new, 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 new. I think a lot of the excitement is going to be where we have enough of a time series to start to really tell what's going on. That is my big excitement. And thank you for saying that, TJ, because um, I hadn't really said that. Uh, okay, um, let's say let's have two more questions. So there's there's well there's a couple that have just come in um, around. Um, uh, I'm not gonna. Th there's one about what's the best machine learning technique to reconstruct chlorophyll. I would say just attend the machine learning lecture and yeah. ask that question there. Um, Dave uh, will be much better at answering that uh, than us. I mean, Absolutely. you might have some insight, but I would recommend. Uh, waiting for the machine learning AI uh, section. But also as a level two product, you can get the neural net derived chlorophyll A and neural net is already a very advanced machine learning approach to deriving chlorophyll A. And that is delivered to you as a product. You don't have to do it yourself. Um, you can compare the OC4ME, which is perhaps better for open waters and the neural net, which is you know perhaps better in more complex waters, but really um, that exists. Um, and it is very worthwhile looking at. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, this this is this can be available to you in a level two product already. Just to be aware of that. Um, and there's been a few more questions again around proxies. Uh, you know, can you can can satellites uh, detect perhaps underwater earthquakes from sediments or algae or blooms? Um, I mean, if it's at the right time, you know, um, often. You know, you can detect huge rafts of pumice, um, and if you try and age where it came from, you can assess where that underwater volcanic eruption could have been. Um, but the ocean is very, very big, and these things tend to be quite small. Um, and so the proxies tend to happen later, and then you can backtrack and look for the origin. Um, and I know that there are people who are doing their PhDs on this sort of work. Um, but again, the ocean is very big and you're looking for things that happen quickly um, or over a matter of days um, on small scales, mostly. Um, so if you're like me and you like looking for needles in a haystack, then that that is very much possible um, and tricky. <laughs> I mean, I think, think for that question, it's a case of, you know, if you have a hypothesis that the disturbance from the earthquake is going to cause some response, then you can go yeah. and test it. Yeah. I mean, trying to trying to uh, let's say reactively spot an earthquake from ocean color or something like that. I mean, we have seismometers that do it relatively mm. quickly, mm. you know, better than you would do from a satellite. But if you if you're wondering if there's some longer term, you know, over weeks or months impact of that feature, um, then that might be worth going and investigating with with the, this set of sensors. So yeah. um, it can be there's, there's studies on. Sorry, go on. No, no. And if you're in iron limited waters and you have an underwater volcanic eruption, boom, you're going to see a bloom. Absolutely. But if you're not, it might just be changes to sediment. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we're approaching two hours. So I might, uh, I might wrap it up there. Sorry if your questions didn't get answered. Um, we've 
I think Lauren's done admirably uh, I'm in fielding. Stop everything. I'm surprised if he's still fortunate. <laughs> so many. Um, but I would, I would again like to thank her for for giving the lecture. It's been uh, very good. Thank you, and thank you so much for these questions. They were brilliant. I really enjoyed uh, these questions today and the opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and we will see you all again next week, hopefully, um, for uh, uh, for another lecture. Um, so, uh, you know, the format, it'll be, a, uh, again, a lecture with a Q and A at the end. So please, again, uh, prepare your questions for that 1. Um, and we will see you there.